All right, good morning. I'd just rather not preach. We should have just planned to sing the whole day, Brian. Dang it. <laughs> so, um, today will be the last time that Brian leads worship as a staff person here, and I'm just leaving that door open that he might want to come back and be a guest uh, lead worshiper at one point. But anyway, as many of you know, if not all of you, that he and Kristen are heading out to Kansas City here in about a month, and um, he'll be taking a new role at a church out there. And, and uh, so, uh, bittersweet. Um, Brian has had an amazing season of ministry here for sure, as he has not only led worship here, but he has led our missions program, then led the uh, Bread Pub site, and uh, it's been a very fruitful season of ministry, and, and uh, we've had a great chance to watch little Brian grow up. Is he still here? Darn it, he's missing all my good stuff. So anyway, I'll make fun of him later. But So it, it has been tremendous to watch him grow and just his faith in ministry and, and, uh, and then to sort of send him out. And, you know, we, um, it's like I've said, I can't preach about going and sending and all this stuff and not let Brian go. You know, it is a part of God's will for him, a part of God's call on his life. And, uh, you know, like I've talked about, we align our will with God's will and we go where he sends. And so that's what's happened here is God is following, God, Brian is following God's will and uh, going out there. And I know he's going to extend the mission of this church in Kansas City. He's going to take everything from here out there. And so we consider that a blessing to be able to do that and see the greater work of God continue um, out of this church. So we're excited for that. Um, next week at 1230, following the, this service next week, uh, we're going to have a little gathering for Brian down in Rock City, just a way for you to come and, and uh, to hug on he and Kristen, their kids, tell them how much you love them, and uh, pray blessings over them as, as they head out. Also, there'll be a basket there. We hope that maybe you'll bring a card, and uh, love for you to bring a gift card, or maybe just a financial gift just to help them out. Um, it's going to be difficult moving, cost very costly, so uh, we want to bless them in that way as well. Uh, so I hope that you will come and, uh, and be a part of that. You know, um, there's an old saying, especially among preachers, and, and it sort of gets worn out, but it's so very true. The mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. And in so many ways, that is absolutely the case. It's not how many people we can fill in these seats here, but how many people can we continue to send out, just like Brian. How many people can continue to go and do what God has called them to do to take the message of the gospel out and uh, so we're passionate about that here. We love to see people doing the work of ministry out of this place and in the community and around the world. And it very much relates to the series that we're in called The Movement. As we're going back into Acts, we're looking at, you know, what happened after Jesus was resurrected and left this earth. And he gave that mission to those first followers. And, and then they began to take that gospel out. And, and it was less about this building they went to at this location and more about this movement out in the community, in their homes, and in the world. And uh, so we want to get back in touch with that and talk about what does that mean for us today? What does the movement still look like for us and how does that work? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, looking at verses 1 through 13. And let me just say, if you don't have a Bible um, for whatever reason, we would love to give you one. There's one available at the welcome desk out there, and we want to be sure that everyone has one. So if you need one, please be sure and stop by the welcome desk. They'd be glad to, to give you one to keep. So, um, so Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Let me just kind of catch us up a little bit from last week. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus, again, handing them that mission, telling them to stay in Jerusalem and to wait, and uh, telling them the gift of, of God would come and visit them there. And talking about how they would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth, but they were to wait in Jerusalem um, before they went out and did that. And, and uh, so that's what happened. And, and just a little side note, at this point, um, the followers of Jesus had grown well beyond the 12. There were about 120 who were gathered uh, who were a part of this movement that was happening. So just to give you an idea of what's, what's going on at that, at that point. So then we come to Acts chapter 2 to see what happens in Jerusalem. Picking it up with verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So they're gathered in Jerusalem. They're waiting on whatever it is that Jesus said was going to come and was going to happen to them. And uh, this was a specific time, a specific moment called Pentecost. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And then it says this, this wind came. And, and in many ways, the Spirit of God in the Bible is talked about as a wind or the breath of God that comes. And so in this moment, the wind comes, fills the whole room. And then it says that they saw what were like tongues of fire that were set on each one of them. That's another um, way that we think about the Spirit of God is fire. Fire is that thing that consumes consumes all that it changes everything it comes in contact with it's powerful it's a force and so oftentimes the spirit of god is is sort of uh, aligned with the idea of fire and uh, so those come they light on the people uh, and it says the holy spirit uh, caused them to speak in other tongues and you know we probably all bring lots of ideas of what speaking in tongues is to this place and and i'm not even going to veer off into all the possibilities of what that can mean except for what it meant right here in this moment so let's keep going verse five It says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And I went to seminary to be able to say all those names to you today, just so you get that squared away. All right, it's good. We're going to go there. You're going to repeat those back to me next week. But amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So um, there you go. The, all of these people are gathered in this place, and we know that there was a Jewish festival that was happening at this point, and that's why all those folks were gathered uh, in this one place there. And, um, and all these people from all these different countries are, are observing what's going on when the Spirit comes on these followers of Jesus. And probably what happens in that moment is the followers begin to essentially preach the gospel. They begin to talk about Jesus and what happened with him. And as the people are listening, they're hearing it in their own dialect. You know, whatever that was for them, Phrygian and Cappadocian and all those great ones. It's like, how is it that I'm hearing it in my language? They're speaking Galilean, which, you know, a specific language except that the uh, Spirit of God had shown up. And what we know is that this this was a missional moment. This is when the mission began to happen right there as they each hear the gospel preached in their own language such that it changes them so that they then will take that back to wherever they're from, you see. The Spirit of God began this this important movement right then and right there. Now, um, we also call this particular moment Pentecost, Um, Pentecost is from the Greek, which is Pentecostos, which means 50. And uh, this was also something that happened uh, as a Jewish festival, the Shavuot, uh, which this name comes from Leviticus, where it instructs people to count seven weeks or 50 days um, from the end of Passover to the beginning of the next holiday. Now, for us as Christians, what we do is we count the seven weeks or 50 days past Easter, and that's the day of Pentecost. So this year, that Sunday is Sunday, May 24th, when you would celebrate Pentecost and all that. So there's what that is. Now, what we also know this as is the birth of the church. This is the moment at which the church, as we know it, the church that we're still a part of, uh, officially came into existence with the Holy Spirit coming on these folks who are gathered here. And so we always want to remember that a movement of God begins with His Spirit moving in people, right? That's how the church started, and that's what should still be happening today. It is what allows us to do what we do and to be bold. And and God certainly ever since then has been been showing up. You know, he's been uh, sort of opening the window and coming to earth and doing powerful things among individuals and among churches and among just uh, different times, you know, and revivals and all these kinds of things that have happened throughout the year as uh, God has come to earth through his spirit. Now, one thing that happens immediately after this is, uh, is very important. And let me just read it to you. It won't be up on the screen, but it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. 
These people are not drunk, as you suppose. <laughs> it's only nine in the morning. And there's just something I want to say, but I'm not going to say that. But anyway, so no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so he goes back and he pulls from the prophet Joel who says this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so here's Peter. You remember Peter with the foot-shaped mouth? <laughs> it was a little too cocky, you know, who was a little too arrogant, who would get it right and then get it wrong, the one who denied Jesus three times and who left him to go back to fishing, that guy stands up. How does he do that and preach except in the power of the Holy Spirit that had overwhelmed his life at this point? And he begins to explain and declare, here's what is happening here. You see, this was prophesied thousands of years ago when the prophet Joel said that one day the Spirit of God is going to be poured out on his people. And it just started today, Peter said. And as a result of his message and the preaching, and really not as a result of Peter, but the message, it says that many received that word and were baptized on that day. And then it says... 3,000 were added to their number. 3,000. There's not a preacher today who wouldn't kill to have 3,000 people, you know, respond to their message, come pouring in the church. I mean, it's like this was a genuine movement of God. And something powerful happened right here. And it happened because that Spirit of God moved in the hearts of people. It caused them to want to do something. I remember this last summer when uh, our youth, and I went with our youth over to Uganda and uh, to do some work over there and had a great experience. It was amazing. But a big part of what we were doing there was to be involved in these things called Jesus Festivals. And it's just basically lots of Ugandan Christian rap artists. You should Google that, man. It is crazy to hear these, these folks. But anyway, very interesting. And uh, lots of music and then typically preaching that goes for a very long time and and all this kind of stuff. And I remember we went to the beach one day and there was this guy preaching and lots of music and preached forever and it's just long, long, long. And, but at the end, all these youth come up and, and accept Christ and their life has changed. It was just amazing. And, and uh, so our part of this was we were going to be in charge of one of the Jesus festivals at one of the schools that was kind of out in the countryside. And, and uh, so it was a... a it was a Christian school, and it was interesting because I didn't know that at first. And so I was like, all right, so I'm going to be preaching at this Jesus festival. And it's going to be great, you know, and inviting people to come to know the Lord. And he goes, it's a Christian school. And I was like, okay, so I don't know if anybody's going to come to know the Lord that day, but it'll be great because we'll preach anyway. And it was just like, all right, here we go. And we get there, and it was just, it was tough to begin with. The, the Christian rap artists were struggling. They, the, what they do is they sing to their own track. So the guy in the back is supposed to put their track on, and then they sing along with it. And sometimes the guy would get the song wrong, and so this guy would be singing one thing, and the track was singing another. Anyway, it was great. It was fun. And so doing that for a while, and uh, they asked one of our uh, youth to share a testimony. So Lauren Carter shared her testimony, very powerful. And then I got up and preached on the other side of that, and, and uh, you know, d just preached my heart out. You know, it was one of those things, this is just a moment where you just preach, and time is not an issue, and all this kind of stuff. And but anytime you preach cross-culturally, you always feel like you didn't connect. You know, at the end, you're like, ah, oh, they didn't get any of that. I don't think, you know, they're just looking at me. Anyway, so we do the thing that, that they still love to do over there, this evangelistic deal. At the end, you invite people to accept Jesus, and then you have them stand up if they did that, and then they go out to the side to be ministered to by our team. So I did that, and we had a few, and they went outside, and our team went out there to minister to them. And so at the end, I go out there, and what I found what was interesting was the few who stood up and raised their hand that went out there. There was a whole lot more than that by the time I got there because a lot of them didn't want to raise their hand. They didn't want to stand up because, you remember, they're at a Christian school. They, you know, they don't want to be known as somebody who is not a Christian or who has sin in their life. Now, that doesn't happen here. I get that you don't understand that, but it happens over there. And so there were a lot more that came. And so we had, you know, all of us, you know, Pat Bethay's over here and Lauren's over there. I'm over here and all of our youth and lines of kids uh, wanting to talk to us. And I remember this one young man who came to me and, and, uh, and he was, um, 
who's very quiet. You know, he like get the right up, they're right next to you. You know, it can be a little awkward because of our whole social thing. But so it's like, okay. And so he's, he's sharing with me. And it turns out he was a leader among the high school boys. And he had two different Bible studies that he led. And so they considered him a leader. And he was explaining that to me. And, and he said, but I, I am coming to you right now because I need to confess. And I was like, okay. And he goes, he said, even though I'm a leader, I have, um, and basically he just went on to talk about sexual immorality in my life. I have problems with my thoughts. And he said, and I have lied to these guys. And he just kind of unfolded this situation for him. And, and so I was listening. And, and then he just kind of wrapped it up with, and so I'm sitting out there, and I'm listening to this music, and I'm, and I'm hearing that young lady speak and what she had to say about her life, and then the message. And it's like, at one point, as the Spirit was in me, and it broke my heart. You know, it's like, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody talk about it like that, but the Spirit just broke my heart. And I knew what I was doing was wrong. And I needed to say something today. And that's why I've come to you, and I need you to pray for me. And, and my heart was breaking for this young kid. I mean, I'm like, first of all, I can't believe you're even telling me this. You don't know me from anybody. But he had such a need. The Spirit had moved in him so powerfully. And so we prayed, and I prayed for him. And he felt very relieved after that so much that he said, I'm going to go back to those guys, and I'm going to confess to them too because we have to get this right. I was like, oh, that's great. So then behind him, a young girl comes up. She confesses, you know, that she's struggling with her friends, and she needs to leave them because they're dragging her down, but she's afraid to talk to them. Can you pray for me? Yes, pray for you. And prayed for her. And then I'm looking around, and I'm like, all of our team is praying for all these different youth there and the burdens that must have been shared in that moment and it was it was one of those moves of God you know I mean it's just one of those moments where it's like God got into people's hearts and began to break them or do what only God can do in us and that's the same that is so much of what was happening in those early days in the life of the church the spirit of God just coming and and helping encouraging but breaking people's hearts so that they can move forward in their life and we remember that the Holy Spirit is the living Christ not a dead ghost a living spirit that is in us the same power that was raised that raised Jesus from the dead same power that's in us did this happen at the exact same moment in the last service? That's really weird, the rumbling. Feel the power. Spirit of God. You're going to be on your knees in about 10 minutes, I feel like. And what was I saying? Okay. Oh, yeah. So anyway, when you read through Scripture and you're looking at the Holy Spirit, there are like 30 different works of the Holy Spirit in a person's life and, and in this world. So I'm going to go through every one of those. No, I'm not. I'm not going to go through every one of those. We're going to just go through a few of those because I want us to have an understanding of, okay, Rusty, this is all great, but the Holy Spirit in me now, what is it doing in me? What, what, what do I expect from the Holy Spirit? And so let me just mention a few things. One of the things that I'm very aware of is I have people who come to me sometimes, well, not sometimes, a lot of times, and they hold up their Bible and they have something in their line and say, would you please explain that to me? <laughs> I get that a lot. And, and I'm happy to explain that. But I'm also reminded, you know what? Sometimes when I read the Bible, I need a little help. And the help that I get comes from the Spirit of God in me. Because it's the Holy Spirit that makes this book come to life. Such that when I read it, I see me in there. Maybe I need to be convicted of something I'm doing wrong. Well, I read that and I see me in there. Or maybe I just see God literally just speaking into my life something. Whatever it may be. And it's like, man, that today right now well that's the spirit of god in me connecting with the spirit that has brought this word to life paul describes it like this he says in second timothy 3 16 all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness all that we read in this book god breathed it has power god breathed this word so that we would have life you see catch that by the way i'm gonna be using a lot of scripture over the next couple of minutes none of it will be up on the screen so you either really lock in write it down whatever you want to do i'll send you an email later whatever you need okay second thing the spirit is is what guides us whenever we talk about man i need i need guidance i need help from god i need to know my this this way or that way or this decision or that decision well the one that helps us is the spirit that lives in us such that in that moment when we have a decision to make whether it's as small as should i do this right thing or this wrong thing in this moment or where am i going in my life 
we lay our life down to God, align our will with his, and the Spirit of God begins to do his work in us in that moment. Saying, don't do that. Or yes, do that. It comes through prayer and through scripture, through training our own spirit in him, in holiness and righteousness, such that we're sensitive to the spirit moving in us so that we know what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're going to make that next decision. Uh, Jesus says in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I think one of the hardest things that we do in being led by him is letting him do it. Would you agree with me on that? Do you know this guy, Francis Chan? I've referred to him a few times. He's written lots of books and lots of small group studies and all this kind of great stuff. Well, he has this book called Forgotten God, which is all about the Holy Spirit, this sort of forgotten part of God that we don't you know, think about or whatever very much. And so in there, he, he talks about the Spirit like this. And this is it's one of those that you read and you go, oh, don't, don't say that. When it comes down to it, many of us do not really want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Or more fundamentally, many of us don't want to be led by anyone other than ourselves. Anybody want to testify? No? Okay. The whole idea of giving up control or the delusion of it is terrifying. It's one of those things that we think, man, if I give up control, who knows what could happen? Yeah, God might lead you. Oh, anyway. The truth is that the Spirit of the living God is, get this, guaranteed to ask you to go somewhere or do something you wouldn't normally want or choose to do. The Spirit will lead you to the way of the cross as He led Jesus to the cross, and that is definitely not a safe or pretty or comfortable place to be. The Spirit will lead you. He'll lead you out on the water where it's difficult, where the waves are big and the wind is going. He'll lead you to difficult places at your job. You know, He'll call you to do things that are not easy. And doesn't it kind of make you wonder sometimes if I feel so good about my nice, comfortable, easy life, is the Spirit leading me? (laughs) Or am I finding it challenging to do this? You know, I want to live a life that's not too easy. I want the Holy Spirit leading me to those hard places, challenging me to do things I wouldn't normally want to do. It's what I've said about this church for the last 16 years. There is no way. I could have ever started a church or led it. It's only the Spirit of God that can do that. It is that God wanted it to happen. And in so many ways in our lives, we have to look around and go, is God working in and through me in a way that is very apparent? Like, I can't live this except God is doing it. Spirit guiding us. All right, let me keep moving. It's the Spirit that helps us also in those moments when we're trying to connect with God through prayer. And I don't know about you, but I have had a few hard moments when I began to pray and had no idea what to say because something was hurt so bad. And you're like, I don't know. I got nothing. (laughs) And what's great is, in those moments as a believer, it's where the Holy Spirit comes in and says, oh, I got it for you. I know what you need to say. And he, as the Bible says, intercedes on our behalf. In fact, it says in Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Have you ever just groaned out a prayer? (laughs) Spirit's like, man, I got that. I know exactly what you said. Let me take care of that for you. And in those moments, we receive what God needs to give us at that time. Spirit is also something that that helps us do anything good in life. You know, it's like anything good that we're able to do in this world— It is only because the Spirit of the living God lives in and through us. We talked about that last week, right, with those things that are produced out of our life, those good fruits. And Paul likes to think of us as a tree, and we're planted, and deep roots are going down. And because of that, the Spirit is nourishing us from the inside and going up, and it's producing leaves. And and then this good fruit that hangs off of us, that helps us do what God's called us to do. And he says it like this in Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So that you are not to do whatever you want. (laughs) Okay, anyway. But the fruit of the spirit is, you ready? Remember this from last week? What? Love, joy. This was your homework. I mean, what are you doing? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-controlled, kindness. Where am I? I've lost 
Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, Rusty, you didn't do your homework. All right, it's good. These, these are the fruits that are born in our life, right? The Spirit of God welling up in us. And then he says, against such thing there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since we're supposed to be living in the Spirit, we have to stay in step with it. It's moving in a particular way in our life. And we have the ability to not move with it. You realize that? Maybe you've tried that before. But he's like, man, I'm taking a step. Take it with me. Go with me. I know this. you don't understand it, but that's okay. Or maybe it's going to be hard. Don't, don't worry about it. Keep in step with me. Come with me in that. That's what the Spirit does. And then this last thing. The power of the Holy Spirit brings boldness to our faith. Our faith without the Spirit means I just draw back into comfort. My faith with the Spirit of God causes me to step out with courage. A courage that I don't have, that I can't well up in me, but it comes from somewhere else. It helps me to do things, again, that I wouldn't normally want to do. And there's this guy named A.W. Tozer, and he's a theologian, and he said this. I thought it was interesting, just about spirituality and what we want the Spirit to do in our life. And he said, we may as well face it. The whole level of spirituality among us is low. We have measured ourselves by ourselves until the incentive to seek higher plateaus in the things of the Spirit is all but gone. Ouch. That, mm. And then he says, we have imitated the world, sought popular favor, manufactured delights to substitute for the joy of the Lord and produced a cheap and synthetic power to substitute for the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's just get on our knees and repent and go home. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I read that, I was like, that is amazingly true. And it's like we're, we're so quick to grasp for things in this world that will bring us joy and hope and help and fulfillment. We're grasping, grasping, grasping. The Spirit of God is like, what are you doing? That is complete unfulfillment. You'll never find what you need there. And it's like on the positive side, he's saying, you know, we should be seeking like more of that spirit in our life so that we're, we're, we're seeing a next plateau and then a next plateau and then this next move of God in our life, next level of faith that he's calling us to. Like for the rest until we have breath in our lungs, there is another place we can go to with this, Right? And it's just inviting God to do his work in us and saying, I am, I am available. I'm available, God, with everything that I am and all that I have and all my resources and anything that you've given me, my mind, my heart, my body. I am available to you. And you know what? Here's the truth, folks. He is all you have. We really don't have anything anything of any worth if we don't have God. He is the thing that's going to get us through this life and to the next life and in the next life anything else that we have that we think is of any worth will mean nothing. The only thing that we have is the spirit of the living God in us. Do you agree with me on that? And isn't the challenge to live that out every day? Living it out every day every moment, not compromising. Let's pray. Well, God, just as those early believers 2,000 years ago needed you, <laughs> we need you today. We are desperate for you because we have realized that this world has nothing to offer any of us. It is empty. You are the thing that we need to inform our lives, to instruct us, to guide us, to help us pray, to help us understand your will for our life, to give us boldness in our faith, to stand on our convictions. All of these things, God, we need you. We are desperate for you. And Lord, for some of us, maybe the boldness is just a decision that we make right now today because the Spirit has moved in us. A decision to accept you for the very first time. Even We've never done that before, but today we make a choice. Jesus, I accept you. I believe in you. 
I need you. Or a, uh, just a decision to stand firm, to drive a stake in the ground and say, I am, I am firm in my faith in Jesus Christ and tomorrow I will live that out. Maybe that decision needs to happen today. I will stand with my marriage. I will stand by my kids. I will, I will stand up at work. I will stand up at school. I will, whatever it takes, God, you will guide me and direct me from this point forward. God, maybe that's a decision somebody needs to make today and I pray that you would help them that you would give them the courage and boldness to do that. And Lord, for every single one of us here, we need your boldness. We need to go forward in our life knowing that you are ahead of us and that you are going to take care of us. And you're out there, you're on that rough water, but you're calling us out. And God, thank you for choosing to give us a part of you. Because you see us as worthy of that. And you love us that much and you believe in us enough to give us the mission of growing your kingdom here on earth. God, thank you for that. And today we're here because of that. And so we worship you and we put you at the highest place. And we say thank you for loving us the way that you do. We pray this in the strong and powerful name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.